Good evening, Dr. Alasia. Um, so good to have good you. Good evening. And um, it's wonderful to have you speaking with us. Um, viewers, I'm talking with Dr. Datmey Alasia. Dr. Alasia is a nephrologist. He's a consultant, respiratory physician. Is uh, a former chairman of the Nigeria Medical Association River State Branch. And he is a member of the Technical Committee on COVID-19 in River State. Uh, Dr. Alasia is also, and I say that very proudly, a Rotarian, <laughs> and the past president of the Rotary Club of Port Harcourt GRA, as well as um, uh, has held several other positions in Rotary. I'm not going to go into that. But we have Dr. Alasia here because, honestly speaking, we are still having conversations around COVID-19, what are the things we can do to stay safe, and who better to speak to than a respiratory physician. Dr. Alasia, thank you for joining us. Good evening. Thank you and good evening. So, COVID-19, and we woke up this morning to news that we have one confirmed case in River State. Is this true? Yes, it's true. The NCDC uh, confirmed that yesterday. So it's, it's on the NCDC website. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, it's true. Okay. What is the implication for us as Rivers people now that we have a confirmed case in River State? I mean, before now, we were, it was bliss. Ignorance is bliss. And we were quite satisfied praying for our brothers and sisters in other states of the federation. Now it's here with us. What is that? What's the implication for us? Well, the implication is that uh, if there were, if there were anyone who had doubts about this disease, um, it's time for those doubts to, uh, put, to put to rest. Mm -hmm. But I think it also presents uh, opportunity too uh, for us to strengthen the things that we have been doing, um, focus more on the issues on the on how to prevent uh, the advisory that has that has gone out, mm -hmm. those who don't believe need, need to take it uh, seriously. Some of the social distancing uh, uh, measures we need to also cooperate to ensure that we achieve that and cut out the spread. We also need more social responsibility mm -hmm. uh, for from uh, citizens. So if there's anyone who has anything that they think is of concern, they should report appropriately appropriately to the uh, public health authorities through appropriate channels. And it's also something that should also make us think about our healthcare, healthcare system, mm -hmm. uh, because even countries that are supposedly strong yeah. seem, seem to be struggling a bit. Yeah. So it's something that should make us think of our healthcare system too, and it presents an opportunity for us to realize that we need to strengthen and we need to prepare. We don't need to wait for it to happen before we prepare. Yeah. Well, one of the things you talked about is social responsibility, and I think that that's a major issue here. Um, so basically, you're saying if you see something, say something. Yeah. And and, and do uh, and do the right thing. Do the right thing. Yeah, I'll, I'll give you an instance. Uh, sometimes citizens can be what evasive. Yes. I'll give you an instance. There's someone who has been somewhere mm -hmm. and doesn't report that he's been somewhere. Yeah. That someone who has been somewhere and is expected to take the time off and stay at home, mm -hmm. he or she doesn't do that. Yeah. So those are the kind of things that everyone needs to, uh, you know, some social responsibility. Yeah. And if you are in control of a situation where you need to reduce mass mass gatherings and you fail to do so, you're also not uh, doing well in terms of your social responsibility. So those are some of the things that we think that citizens can do at this point in time. So who are those who, who, who should be more afraid? I mean, we ought to be afraid. But who are those who should worry more about this whole pandemic? Okay, well, first of all, we should all worry. But we know that we have uh, what we would describe as vulnerable, vulnerable people. Mm -hmm. And I like to use the... Um, the uh, phrase fragile and frail. Yeah. So the fragile are those who are very young, under, under, under five, like children, and then frail are those who are elderly above 65. Mm. And even for usual respiratory uh, infections, people at these extremes of age tend to fare worse. Yeah. So these people are those who we consider as very vulnerable. 
So the protection should is higher. Mm-hmm. Uh, there's a time when we need to, to protect them more. Mm-hmm. Um, they may need to rest more and not go out too often. So mm-hmm. social distancing is key for them. Mm-hmm. Uh, for instance, even for those of us who are in the in the healthcare space, mm-hmm. uh, you have children, you have kids at home. Of course, when you come back, the first thing you want to ensure the kid may not understand and and, and, and he, <laughs> I want know, to she, run and hug you. Jump yeah. At you. Yeah. yeah, but you need to know that you may need to go and ensure that your hands are washed and all of that just to just to pr- protect them. And this is time when we need to do things for those who are who are at the uh, the, the higher end of the scale. Yes. in terms of the elderly and of course we know that there are those who have existing diseases mm-hmm. disease of the lung diabetes hypertension those things that can make the immune system weak yeah. and those who have problems with the heart so those are the kind of people that we're also worried about what are some of the specific interventions that we can you know that 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 are necessary for the elderly you know of course an aged mother and aging father or someone in the community what are some of the things we can do specifically to keep them safer well from um, what we see uh, around around the world the most effective strategies social distances so this is not a time when you want them to get into the community Mm -hmm. uh, especially with people who are much younger than they are or, or, or anyone at all so this is the time when they need to just take a real break and a real rest and stay away from much of these social activities. Uh, Dr. Lassia, there's some of the things I have um, myself falling into doing. Um, you know, we've heard all kinds of things. We've heard, let's use steam therapy, put in some menthol there, boniki, and cover your head to keep COVID-19 away. Uh, others say use a hairdryer and blow some hot air into your nostrils and throats and it will keep it away. Others say, you know what, boil lemon and uh, there's no lemon in the market anymore, by the way. So we're boiling <laughs> lemon and ginger and everything and dogo yaro and we're covering ourselves with it. All of these things, which we call natural methods to help us keep COVID, you know, can any of them help? Well, uh, the, the first thing I want to say is that when you're dealing with situations like this in infection pre- pre- prevention, the first thing is you want to eliminate the threat. Eliminating the threat means that you don't come in contact with someone who, who, who has it. And then you also don't contri- contribute. Mm-hmm. So, of course, that's why we focus on cough etiquette and hygiene. Yeah. You don't just cough out, you don't sneeze out, you don't throw spittle sp- 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 around. You keep a distance. If you have an illness, you protect others mm-hmm. by putting on a mask. And we see this happen in other parts of the world where as you walk out in the morning, you see a mask on people and you know that he or she has a cold or a cough. So eliminating the threat is the most important thing that we don't come in contact with it. Okay. Washing our hands and sanitizing because you may have touched some, some surface and you don't want to take what you have touched and put on your body or your face. So those are the most effective things. Now, coming to some of these uh, th- uh, therapies, mm-hmm. the fact is that steam uh, in- inhalation is actually intended to help bring, break, up, break up mucus. So if you're doing it, you're doing it because you have a cough or a cold and you want to relieve nasal congestion or break up mucus and, uh, and, and, and bring it out. Steam uh, using a dryer, the mm-hmm. truth is that the dryer may have a lot of things that you don't even know. So a lot of bacteria would be in there and then you're just blowing it out. And mm. that's why we even don't advise people to use the hand, the hand dryers yeah. in, the in certain public places because oh. you don't know what is collected in there. So exactly. we always advise better to wash your hand. If you don't have any disposable tissue, just hand dry it, let the hand dry, that's fine. And naturally, nature has a way. So nature has, to give, has, has made some form of of protection mm-hmm. and our airway is moist yes. so the nasal mucosa is moist and it goes down mm-hmm. and the essence is that that helps to trap things so things don't get down so if you use a dryer and you dry your airway you're actually doing harm because you're yeah. reducing your natural defense uh, mechanism that god has made oh my and god. if you use mentor that is too harsh 
-hmm. You can also damage the airway and take away your, your natural protection. So those things are not really useful. I'd rather describe them as myths rather than, <laughs> than facts for prevention. Okay, okay so out, out, out of the window goes by eucalyptus oil then. Out of the window, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, Dr. Lassia, you know, we talked about strengthening the health systems and I, I thought that that's something we should talk about now. Um, so first is, we'll, we'll you know, look at what can the ordinary citizen do to support our health systems. Let's not kid ourselves. Clearly, it is frail. Um, clearly, it is frail. frail. But what can the ordinary citizen do at this point to support the health systems as we deal with COVID-19? Okay, yeah. So for me, the first thing that they can do is uh, take the advisory from the public health authorities seriously, mm -hmm. uh, do the things that we have been asked, we have been asked to do, support the healthcare workers in any way uh, maybe a free ride maybe something and uh, so like they say while while, while you while, while you stay at home mm -hmm. they have to stay at work to keep us safe mm -hmm. so it's something we need to consider and this is the time for, for philanthropy at different levels yeah. so this is not the time to walk into a shop and buy uh, 20 cartons of a mask which mm -hmm. you may never need right. because someone else needs it People who have healthcare issues may need it. Health workers may need it to protect themselves in caring for people. So those are some of the things that citizens can do to support the healthcare system. Uh, countries across Africa, including Ni 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 Nigeria, mm -hmm. received a donation from uh, Jack Ma, the Chinese billionaire who is the founder of uh, Ali Ali yeah. Baba. Yeah. Yeah. So this is the time for that kind of philanthropy okay. to put things where we can to bridge the gap and the weaknesses in the healthcare healthcare system and that's where we now call for a public private mix because at the end of the day we are one there's no gap between public and, and private in this so everybody must bring in bring in their resources to see that we can have what it takes and bridge the gaps that we know exist and see that we come out of this good what can government do um, government is looking overwhelmed at this point. Uh, but what can government do? What lessons can it take away from this? And how can it build on those lessons going forward? Yes, the, the first thing, I would just like to, to go back to what the DG of the, of the WHO said. He said, even when you do these lockdowns and social distancing, it is not all. You must focus on building capacity of healthcare personnel. This is the time to recall people who have been who have been retired. You need to motivate motivate volunteers. Mm -hmm. You must commit resources mm -hmm. to bridging these gaps. Mm -hmm. So those are the things that government can do. And above all, leadership, leading from the front. That's this is what we want to see our leaders doing. Right. We see leaders in other parts of the world doing this. They are leading from the front. Okay. And it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. If you have a governor, a president work, come into a hospital where people are working and yeah. tells them, I see what you're doing, I, 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 I appreciate it. Mm -hmm. It goes a long way. Right. This is the time for leaders to lead from the front mm -hmm. and motivate, motivate people, commit the resources that they need to. Mm -hmm. And learning from this is to say that when all of this is over, because we know it will, yeah. everything that has a beginning will have an end. That's right. When all of this is over, we must take the lessons to say we must prepare for the next one. Mm. Even if it never comes, but we must begin to prepare for the next one. Mm -hmm. um, the key pillars for, uh, for, the human, for health, human resource. And Nigeria is not doing well on that score. Yes. Uh, many of the ones we have are, are shipping out. Yeah. Um, yeah. So across all the cadres, whether it's dental technicians, doctors, pharmacists, nurses, all through the all through the healthcare space, mm -hmm. financing, because people have to pay out of pocket. So we must take the issues of mandatory health insurance very seriously, mm -hmm. and critical mm -hmm. assessment. It's easy to build to build the. A 10, 10, 10 uh, hospitals. But you want to ask yourself, how many bed spaces? Because that's what we are seeing happening now. 
people are not talking about the number of hostels we have. They're yeah. talking about how many beds, yeah. how many tiers, mm -hmm. how many ventilators for the population. That's so right. real healthcare assessment in terms of our, our, our resource capacity has to be done. And you have to match it to the population that we have. So those are some, some because we see the very big and strong country, countries struggling. Yesterday, we had the mayor of New York talking about he needed 26,000 yes. respirators, and he got 400. And we were wondering what he was going to do with, with 400. So it's that to that extent that our healthcare, healthcare planning yeah. has to go down to those minute details. Mm -hmm. So I think those are the lessons that we should take away from this. Wow. Dr. Lazia, thank you very much. Um, thank you very much. Very enlightening. It's been my pleasure. You. And um, thank you. we're going to come back again and again. Uh, <laughs> and keep our finger yep. on what's okay. going on in River State. Stay safe. We'll stay at yes, home. Yes, we do our best to stay safe. All right. Yeah, yeah. Thank All you. Right. Thank you very much. Okay, yeah. bye. Bye. bye.